forward march. We do not stop until the sun falls beneath the tree line. I am Sangrama, honored general of the Khmer Empire, tasked with quelling a rebellion. Just a year after the passing of the revered Suryavarman, his successor faces staunch opposition. This chaos threatens to dismantle the empire that took nearly five decades to build. Inspiring an army of largely levy soldiery is difficult. Most are simple farmers and craftsmen, strangers to the ways of war and the grim chaos of battle. They should understand the cause for which they fight. As we trudged through the mud, I summoned the captains to the front of the line. I told them of the events that occurred before many of them were born. They would use this knowledge to inspire their men to fight. Surya Varman was once little more than a magnet with a minor claim to the throne held by another. Udiaditya Varman I had established his seat in Angkor, claiming the entire empire as his dominion. Gathering his army, Surya Varman marched on Angkor from the west, establishing a camp not far from the city. The captains listened eagerly as I gave my account of the usurpation. Despite a numerical disadvantage, Surya Varman's tactical acumen proved critical to the success of such a risky offensive. Droves of Uriatitya Varman's troops fell to Surya Varman's disciplined infantry and elephant corps. Entering Angkor, Surya Varman gave the order to his disciplined army that the city was to be left intact, the civilians unharmed. He would not begin his rule by committing acts of savage tyranny upon his own people. Ascent to power does not come easily. Once the head of one beast is removed, three spring to take its place. Thus it was with Surya Varman's enemies. Rebel factions sprung up to the north, east, and south of Angkor. Legions of disgruntled soldiers marched on the city, threatening to topple Surya Varman just as quickly as he had ascended to power. The most dangerous rebel faction was led by Jayaviravana, a warlord from Malaysia with a distant claim to the throne. Advancing from the south at a rapid pace, he acquired much support from the local populace. Suryavarman had to act quickly. The rebel forces, were they to unite, would present quite a challenge to an army that had only recently emerged victorious from a grueling campaign. There was precious little time to spare. Humans are interesting creatures. At times, they display incredible brilliance, and yet at others, they behave like obstinate fools. One can only wonder at the folly that caused the rebel factions to not coordinate their forces. A bundle of sticks is difficult to break, but individual twigs snap at ease. Surya Varman's victory assured that his soldiers would not forget this lesson. As the empire boomed, its neighbors became wary. They knew that the growing tiger will gorge itself on the prey that it deems most vulnerable. Some dreaded the looming war and prayed that their fears were unjustified. Others prepared for it. The kingdom of Tambralinga, a vassal of the great Srivijayan Talasocracy, felt particularly threatened by Suryavarman's ambition. The Empire was surrounded by hostile neighbors, and conflict was imminent. It seemed that the only thing left to question 
was who would strike first. Suryavarman was wise enough to know that passivity would only lead to disaster. The various Burmese kingdoms to the west of the empire were hostile, but a potential ally lay beyond. The Cholas, a powerful dynasty based in the south of the Indian subcontinent, also desired to bring about the downfall of the Srivijaya. Dispatching an envoy laden with gifts could be enough to convince Rajendra Chola that an alliance with Suryavarman would be to his liking. Despite the hardships of the journey through hostile territory, the diplomatic convoy arrived in Chola lands largely intact. Rajendra Chola was pleased with the gifts that the envoy lavished upon him. Particularly impressive was the Grand Chariot, a work fashioned by the finest craftsmen in Angkor. Generous offerings and well-chosen words go a long way with a magnanimous ruler. A bargain was struck, and the envoy returned to Angkor bearing news of the Alliance. With the alliance made and the pieces on the board, conflict was inevitable. The Tambralingas themselves posed only a token threat, but they had the support of the immense naval empire of Srivijaya. The prowess of the Srivijaya navy was unmatched, but their coalition was at a strategic disadvantage. The Khmer forces threatened the enemy by land from the north, and by sea from the east, while the Chola struck out from the west. The enemy found themselves surrounded on all sides. Suryavarman sent word to the Chola force to establish a foothold on the Malay Peninsula. Taking the initiative, he ordered the outfitting of a massive navy to challenge the Srivijayans and Tambralingas for maritime supremacy. Everything hinged on the success of the Chola force that had landed on the mainland. If they could present a formidable enough threat and occupy the enemy land forces, Suryavarman would be able to wrest control of the water and launch a devastating amphibious invasion. If the Cholas were driven from their foothold, the Khmer would be forced to face down their opponents alone a prospect that Suryavarman preferred not to contemplate. Storms raged as wooden vessels rammed into one another. A deafening sound prefaced by the whistling of projectiles through the air. Thousands of men sank below the angry waves, never to rise again. The Chola land force fought bravely, holding to the last. Just as it seemed that they were to be defeated by the Tambralinga Srivijaya force, salvation arrived in the form of swarms of Khmer. Victory has a glorious taste. Over the course of a single conflict, the influence and power of the Empire were raised to unprecedented levels. With the maritime rivals of the Empire crushed, Suryavarman set his sights on the mainland. As the war with the Tambralinga Srivijaya alliance had progressed, it had not escaped his attention that rivals closer to home had been plotting and wishing for his ruin. The rulers of the various Burmese and Cham kingdoms slunk around in the shadows like disgraced cowards. Instead of recognizing the superiority of their larger neighbor, they deviously plotted its downfall and encouraged rebellion within it. This behavior was unacceptable. Suryavarman's enemies may have been too intimidated to face the Khmer juggernaut head on, but Suryavarman had no reservations about challenging his neighbors. 
It was high time that the Empire saw further expansion. The Mekong and Chow Phraya rivers snaked through rich, fertile lands held by decadent, unstable kingdoms ripe for conquest. Triumph would add yet another achievement to Surya Varman's legendary military record. Hegemony is a wonderful thing. The power and prestige of the Khmer Empire reached new levels under Suryavarman I, and all prospered. Despite being known as a great conqueror, Suryavarman was not simply a militaristic aggressor. His reign was marked by vast improvements in the general infrastructure of the Empire, and an emphasis on religious toleration. He erected numerous palaces and temple complexes and ruled benevolently. His legacy lives through these structures, the pride of our citizens and the strength of the Khmer Empire. This legacy is a cause worth defending. It is this notion of greatness that you must invoke to electrify the minds of the common soldiery. <laughs>